Anybody hear me? Yes. Okay, just checking. Thank you for joining us today uh, for the first ever Manufacturing First Career virtual event. We're so pleased that you're here today where you're going to be able to hear from many people working in manufacturing careers. In fact, we have 10 different people that will be speaking about their career along with uh, a college associate dean um, sharing about engineering careers. Uh, so today's event um, is brought to you by the New Manufacturing Alliance and the organization is um, in Northeast Wisconsin, needless to say. Um, we have over 300 members and our manufacturing companies actually employ 23% um, of all the jobs in Northeast Wisconsin. So there's a lot of people that work in manufacturing and you're gonna hear from a variety of careers today. So let's get started. The first uh, person that I'm gonna introduce you to is Jonathan with Suburban Enterprises and he's an automation engineer. So Jonathan, would you like to share about your career? Um, hello, um, like she said, my name is uh, Jonathan um, with uh, Suburban Enterprises. Um, I'm part of the automation division. Um, I, my title is automation engineer. Uh, sometimes that's called a control engineer, depending on you know, what the, the company um, decides to call it. I've been doing controls and automation for about uh, 15 years now. Um, before that, I went and got um, schooling in uh, mock school engineering. So I was actually uh, lucky enough to have high school credits that I took in from electronics classes and career classes that were able to transfer to Fox Valley Tech. Uh, and then from there, all of my credits were actually able to transfer down to MSOE. So that, that was worked out really well for me in, in um, uh, moving into an engineering uh, type career as being able to uh, use all those credits to transfer them uh, down there. So uh, a typical day for me as a, as a controls engineer, as an automation engineer, um, can vary quite a bit. Um, I can uh, range from you know, working and helping customers quote projects, so coming up with new projects, going to customer sites, working with them, coming up with a, a rough design. Um, you know, as, as those, those projects come, you know, come into the company, you know, start to work out more of those detailed designs, come up with, okay, we want this piece of machinery to work with this piece of machinery, okay, and then what does it take to put those two together? You know, is it you know, hardwired signals? Is it communication with ethernet or some other type of protocol? making sure that these PLCs and these drives and these HMIs can all kind of talk together. Um, along with all of the, the projects that we'll do, we'll put together, you know, bill of material, order parts, get all the parts that we need in order for the project to be successful. Um, put drawing packages together to make sure that uh, the individuals that are out in the field that are gonna be wiring these up and hooking all this machinery up have the, the direction, the knowledge that they need to uh, to put that together uh, correctly in a timely fashion. Um, so then once we kind of get all that engineering and that design work done, it's you know, actually programming PLCs, programming HMIs, developing uh, an interface for operators to, to, to make that machinery all kind of work together. And then ultimately, once we do all that programming, we did all those drawings, that design, going on the customer site, implementing it, putting it together, making it all work, provide training to the operators and, and the customer to uh, make sure that they're successful with that, that machine upgrade um, you know, or that machine integration that we had done. So some of the things that I really enjoy about being a controls or an automation engineer is the ability to you know, figure something out, problem solve, and actually make that machinery you know, do what it's supposed to do. So to me, being able to you know, work on a paper machine with a conveyor and you know, that paper would have the index and um, make it so that it doesn't jam up and hit the next ream of paper in front of it. You know, working through all those problems and working through so that you know, it provides that detail that what the customer is looking for. So that problem solving, figuring some of the things out, some of the other projects and other things that I've worked on or I've worked out with um, 
you know, boat engines and hooking them up to a PLC and a control system with servo motors and other drives to provide a test to it. So the write a PLC program that starts the engine, runs it up to its max RPM, all while it's taking sensor data and collecting it, and then you know shutting it back down and giving it a pass or fail. To me, those are some of the more funner, more exciting projects that I've worked on. So to me, it's as far as being an automation engineer and, and the excitement level that I get is it's being able to, you know, take that issue, that problem and resolve it and actually see it work out in the field and be able to see that machine do what it's supposed to do and, and move. So I kind of joke about how, you know, sometimes you get a conveyor to move and you get a product to stop right where you want it to stop. To me, that's really exciting because, you know, there's a lot that goes involved to make that actually happen. So that, that's what um, I enjoy most about being an automation engineer. Thanks so much, Jonathan. It's great to hear your passion for your career. Next, we're going to be having Bob uh, from Sargento join us, and he is in production. Bob. Good morning. I'm Bob Barnes. I'm the Director of Manufacturing Support uh, for here at Sargento. I've been here for two and a half years. I've also been in manufacturing for 38 years. I actually started out sweeping the parking lot of a manufacturing plant to earn money for college. At that point, I had no intention of staying in manufacturing. I really, my passion then was computer science. I was enrolled at the local community college and had plans on going to the university after that to get my bachelor's degree. That sweeping the parking lot job led me to that 38 year career in manufacturing that I have today and I love. Uh, over the years I've held, uh, I did a short stint at entry level production to get started. I was a maintenance technician, a maintenance supervisor, a maintenance manager, project manager, manufacturing manager, plant manager, and now director. Uh, my education includes, I have a two year degree in computer science, a two year degree in industrial maintenance, a bachelor's degree in business ad band. I earned my black belt in Lean Six Sigma and I have an MBA. Over 10 years of college and not one student loan. Over 90% of all that education was paid for by my employers. I've also invested thousands of hours over the last 38 years in company provided training and self-study. Uh, my current position requires a minimum of a master's, a master's degree. But all that education, work experience, and that black belt help advance my career. But I'm here to tell you today, don't discount your high school experience. There are things that I learned in high school that built a solid foundation for my career. I developed my interest in computers during high school. Believe it or not, that's how old I am. The very first desktop computer came out while I was in high school. I took my first computer programming class in high school. I actually took a year of residential wiring, actual classroom, and then my class got to wire a new house that was being constructed. Um, with supervision, of course, Daryl, I know what Daryl was thinking. I already had a love for mechanical things, especially cars. This led me to my awesome career in maintenance. That same electrical teacher in high school introduced me to root cause analysis. This skill I use daily, and it led me to my black belt. Uh, minor skills that people don't think about. I took two years of typing in high school. I don't even think there's typewriters anymore. They may call it keyboarding now, but I was preparing myself to be the most efficient computer programmer. I wanted to know my way around that keyboard. I can't tell you the thousands of hours I've saved myself by being able to type fast. That's the most overlooked skill I think there is. Take every opportunity to hone your public speaking skills. Being able to speak in front of others is a critical skill in all leadership positions. I would put this in top three. I started that skill in high school as well. My current job responsibilities, I have responsibility for costs for all three plants here at Sargento. For manufacturing, I direct the continuous improvement efforts, training, and my favorite part of my job is working with our youth programs. My average day, I spend time coaching, mentoring others, uh, reviewing financial reports, planning, reviewing metrics, meetings, problem solving. I get to work with people throughout the company and across all functions. So what do you need to get into an entry level job here at Sargento? You need to have a good attitude. You've got to have good work ethics. So what is good work ethics? Be on time. Give eight hours of work for eight hours of pay. 
do your best, be willing to learn, be a good team member, respect others, work with your team to deliver the required results. So how did I get to my level? Well, I had a great attitude. I have great work ethics. I have a burning desire in my soul to continue to learn new things every single day. I learned how to be that best team member first. Then I learned how to be the best team leader. And then I learned how to build those teams. I have a true passion for passing on knowledge and helping others. That's why I'm here today speaking to you students. Every one of you have a choice to make. You can decide right now between being good or being great. Good is okay, but if you wanna make it to the higher levels, great's gonna be required. So why do I love manufacturing so much? It's paid for my education. It's provided well for my family. I've had ample opportunities to travel. I've had solid retirement funds built. I've been a part of world-class teams. And I've been able to shorten the path of others by shining the light on that path, like others have done for me. My advice for you today is take a good look at manufacturing and see what it has to offer. And the most important thing is choose to be great in whatever you do. Thank you for your time and good luck students. Thank you so much, Bob. That's one great thing about manufacturing. Most of the companies I know about have tuition reimbursement and they are able to help pay or pay entirely for your education. So thanks so much, Bob, that was a great message. Daryl from Sargento in the maintenance area will be joining us next. Daryl. All righty, good morning. Um, my name is Daryl Morzinski. I'm currently the maintenance reliability engineer at Sargento. I've been there for a few years now. I'll, I'll start out with my education and my work experience background, and then I'll get started on uh, what's it like to be a maintenance engineer. Um, Bob alluded to earlier, uh, he was in maintenance. Maintenance and operations are basically inseparable. You need both of us in order to be successful in, in the business. So I started out went to school. I've always been a, a Wisconsin native. I uh, went to Manitowoc Lincoln, pursued my engineering degrees in industrial and systems engineering at uh, the UW systems. And uh, after about 10 years I was in the workforce, um, I decided to go back and get my MBA. And again, as Ann talked about, we, uh, we had that full education of the MBA paid for by my, by my employers. So my uh, work experience, I started out uh, during college, I was trying to pay for my college just like the next kid, and I worked at the city engineering department up in Manitowoc. So those guys on the side of the road doing road surveys, um, one of those was me. And I, I helped create the bid documents and stuff to help design streets and sewer systems and those type of things. From there, I went on and I worked for Parker Hannafin Company. I was a design engineer. It was probably one of my favorite jobs and something you guys should consider is do something you enjoy, right? So my favorite job was I got to go to the end customer first, understand their needs and be able to design the hydraulics for GI case and John Deere tractors and all that stuff. Take it back to the plant, take it back to the SAE committees, um, design what they needed, take it all the way through the manufacturing process, bring it in hand and take it actually back to the customer. So it was full uh, cradle to grave type applications. And uh, that really helped drive me towards my, uh, my maintenance career. From there, I went on, I worked in uh, stainless steel press facilities, worked in furnace applications, did a lot of automated uh, press loading with four to six access robots, those type of things. That's what a lot of my background was involved in. I then went to high-speed packaging and from high-speed packaging, making something like uh, a Clorox canister wipe or a coffee filter type thing. I went into Sargento where we did also high-speed packaging, but we're actually putting uh, cheese products in the packages. So why did I choose Sargento? Um, as you can see from my background, I'm working from home today, so they got some pretty great benefits. And it's a little funny for a maintenance guy to be working out of his house, because traditionally, I'm supposed to be on site, you know, turning a wrench and, and fixing equipment. But really, the maintenance uh, field has changed substantially from where it is today. Um, we drive great uh, empowerment and continuous improvement activities at Sargento. I learn a lot of new things in the food industry. But as uh, others have alluded to, after 30 years, I really enjoy mentoring and teaching students. Um, operational maintenance uh, need to be inseparable. And it's important to talk to everybody from the production workers all the way through the high end technical side of things. So um, what's a typical day look like? 
Uh, I maintain the existing equipment used to manufacture the product and also help maintain the building infrastructure. So all the roads, uh, roofs, HVAC systems that uh, we work in. And we have basically four different sites on campus. So do a lot of troubleshooting with the equipment, but more importantly, we don't let it break down in the first place, right? So you wanna keep yourself running, make sure you got proper setups and adjustments on all the equipment, identify why machines are not running at rate or creating product defects, and make sure you're good about asking the employees how their day's going, what symptoms are they seeing on their equipment. That all makes our job a lot easier. So you have to have some, some pretty good people skills. Um, looking at CI initiatives and upkept, upcoming technologies is also the second part of that job. So part of it's maintaining existing equipment, part of it's looking at the new stuff coming up. So we got manufacturing 4.0, we deal with virtual reality training, a lot of stuff like that, new sensors and technologies, and how do you get more predictive? So take a look at your car tires. Uh, you see the pressure right on the dash. Um, so very interesting stuff. But basically a step-by-step -step career path in maintenance, you need to make sure you have the right personal traits. You need to be inquisitive, willing to take an initiative. You're usually the last line of defense. You have to be flexible. You know, At the end of the day, watch the videos how it's made. If you find yourself liking that video, odds are you're gonna be great in the maintenance field. You know, pursue your degrees, get some good at work experience, and at the end of the day, you'll end up finding out you need more HR and people skills and situational leadership. And that's where uh, our, per, our career uh, paths uh, eventually end up. You end up having to work with people. It's not so much about the equipment. So today, thanks again for taking the time to learn a little bit about maintenance and equipment reliability and best of luck in your future. Thanks so much, Daryl, appreciate that. Next, we have Mitch with Cross Industrial and he's in fabrication. Good morning, guys. My name is Mitch and today I'm representing Cross Industrial out of Green Bay, Wisconsin. Uh, we specialize in building systems for the food and dairy industry. So 90 to 95 or 100% of everything we build is food grade uh, stainless material. Um, what I do, I'm a TIG welder and a fabricator myself, and I specialize in building the tanks that go into a lot of these systems. Um, I work with a handful of guys, a small crew that I build tanks with. Um, there's a lot of uh, equipment used going into building these tanks. Everything starts off as a flat sheet of metal, basically, and we build it into what it is. So. Water jet is basically where everything starts, everything gets cut, and then it goes into a CNC roller that we run to roll the bodies, and there's tops and bottoms on the tanks and other components as well, that there's several different pieces of equipment we gotta use, such as a flanger, and then there's some other ones, and obviously you got the welding aspect of everything. Um, some of the things that I like best about my job um, is the atmosphere of the shop. Um, everyone's pretty laid back. Uh, there's not, if you run into issues, you can always ask people questions. You're always learning something. Um, the shop atmosphere, it's awesome. The, you got, there's a lot of different equipment that's really nice. Uh, it's, it's really nice when you got good equipment to use. Um, uh, one, one of the best things about custom fab that I'm in is that a lot of companies, they're doing like repetition parts and it's over and over and over again. Well, when you get into custom fab with stainless steel and what we do for the food industries is that it's, you're never, you're never like redoing things over and over again. You're constantly learning something new. You're constantly building something new. And there's, it's always, uh, it's interesting. It really makes it interesting on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, some of the things that NWTC kids, a lot of you are looking to uh, hopefully get into NWTC. I think NWTC lays a good background for especially the welding and fabricating aspects of the industry. Uh, one of the biggest things I believe in is the blueprint reading class. A lot of you guys are gonna go to NWTC and get your welding degree or if you're in like construction, or machining, I think anything, pretty much blueprint reading class is one of the biggest things. But what a lot of thing, a lot something that a lot of kids 
don't understand is I see a lot of new kids and they're coming into the trade and they think they got to be the best welder and they're not going to be put on a job. It's really not true. I got to work with a lot of younger guys and they come in and I, all I tell them is, hey, like you just got to show up on time every day. You got to show a good work ethic. That's that's the most important thing. I never looked for uh, a kid that's got the best welding skills. I, I look for someone that's teachable and willing to learn and willing to put in the effort to be better on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, some of the things in high school, I think high school lays down a good base for everybody. Um, a lot of high school, like I was from East of Pier and we had a, a small machining class, we had a welding class, and we had some woodworking classes. But it, I think it's to get your foot in the door and really get the kids interested. I mean, obviously in, in my trade, math is one of the biggest things you're gonna learn. So it's, you gotta get good at your fractions and your decimals. So I think for all you kids going out there learning, uh, really looking in high school and other things, communication is key. So good communication classes. And in my opinion, I think business classes are some of the most important things that you can take for any trade that you're looking to get into. I think it displays good. Um, it teaches you a lot, especially for any trade. And that doesn't matter whether you're on the floor welding or you're in the office or doing whatever you're, you're looking to do. But I'd like to thank you guys for listening to what I have to say and good luck to all of you. Thanks so much. Appreciate it, Mitch. Next, um, we have three people from Wisconsin Aluminum Foundry. And we have Rosin, who's a CAD designer, John King, Foundry Careers, and Camber with Quality Careers. Hello, okay, I'm gonna try to pull up this presentation that we put together here. Um, all right, is everybody able to see the PowerPoint? Yes. Okay. All right, so we're gonna go over some, some careers from WAF. Um, I'm Ross Miyanda, I've been here for two and a half years. Um, started off in high school. Um, I was a youth apprentice and uh, now I'm a full-time CAD designer and I'm going to UWGB for mechanical engineering. So a little bit of uh, what I do every day, um, we get quotes from different companies and I bring in the models and the prints and it gets sent over to our uh, quoting engineer and he takes care of how the parts gonna be made, how many we're gonna make in a you know in a step hour, and he's gonna quote all the machine shops and stuff like that that will make the pattern. Um, the video is just showing a model and some stuff that I gotta send over to our coding engineer. Um, next, next, um, once we are awarded the part, we. Um, go into tool designing and in the video here, we got uh, what the part, uh, how our gating system works. This is how um, the metal is gonna flow into the part, how, how the parts can be made. And then over here is some magma. Um, this is just showing us how the metal is flowing in, how hot it's getting, um, how the parts gonna be finished when it comes through our molding system. And there's another video showing it pouring in. All right, and then we're gonna get into the tooling design after we get our, how, how the part's gonna flow and everything's gonna go. This is um, some core. Um, this is what's gonna make the internal passages for the part. And then after we have our core design, we're going to go into making our core box. This is what's going to make the core. And then lastly, this is our um, tooling. Um, this is what's actually going to be run on the machine. So this is a, a diesel plate. This is what will make an imprint on the on the machine and then this is how all the metal and stuff will flow in. Um, so there's a lot of different jobs in engineering. We got engineering from quoting engineers to 
CAD designers that are going to work on uh, initially making the part, making all the tooling that goes into it, and then we have um, engineers that look at you know how much time is going to be used to um, make the part, you know, stuff like that, just time wise. And then we have uh, engineers that take care of um, when the part needs uh, new revision, you know, something's being changed, they'll take care of that. They handle all that stuff. So um, there's plenty of jobs for engineering. I mean, not only here, but there's, you know, plenty of jobs for engineering in different fields, um, you know, different stuff, depending on what you want to do for CAD. So that's all I got. <laughs>
in our pattern shop here. So if you're a little handy with wood, basically uh, all the repairs and everything that are done on our pattern that involves wood is done right here. This is a gold box machine uh, to, to make our internal core. The sand is basically blown into the box and cured with CO2. Uh, roughly 30 some seconds uh, of cure time and uh, we have a core. Here we go. Uh, work on the bench here. Basically, we want to make sure that our gases are cleaned up so that the customer uh, gets exactly what they're asking for. And then we have a lot of stuff to move in this place, so plenty of forklift drivers. Make sure our castings don't leak. Uh, we got these impregnating units. Uh, operators getting everything loaded up into the baskets, and then uh, they'll load them up into these large vessels up here. We have a guy over there that's uh, on a test tank, uh, checking the gases to make sure that uh, they're pressure tight. All right, and next we have Cameron Delman. She's our quality process development technician, and she also has a video, so here it is. Hi, I'm Cameron Delman. I work in the quality department at Wisconsin Aluminum Foundry. Um, I have been there for two and a half years. Um, I basically got my job there because I was just looking for a new job. And I have quite a few family members that work at the foundry and they love working there. So one of them just told me, hey, apply, see what's available. Okay. So then I applied, got my process sheet development technician position. Um, and I had no idea what I was getting myself into. I had absolutely no background in anything, even factory wise, so let alone foundry wise. Um, I never went on to school after high school, so I had no background in anything else. Um, so I got this job. Everything that I know today, I was taught on the job. So, I went to one blueprint reading class just to kind of teach me like just the general things. Um, and then in January, I will be going to school for quality assurance technician. But like I said, everything that I know today besides that blueprint reading class that I went to at LTC is just on the job. So now I want to show you a little of what I do. So I do the process sheets work instructions. And what that is, is instructions for the guys on the floor so they know how parts are made depending on what machine they're on and how parts get finished. So now here are just different examples of different sheets. So here's box one of two of this shell core sheet. And then we have box two of two that box one and two are put together. So then after that, we are brought to the DESA sheet, which is just a machine that this part is made on. And this gives you all the parameters, just like every other process sheet on how these parts are to be made. So then after we have the shell core, DESA sheets, possibly permanent mold sheets, we come to the finishing sheet, which will tell the guys on the floor how parts need to be sanded and just finished, um, whether they go into heat treat, if they get blasted, if there's any specific customer requirements, and then whether it goes through impregnation or it's pressure tested. However, this tells us exactly step by step how this part needs to be finished. And in order to tell the guys how these parts are finished, we get to look at different blueprints. 
So here's different examples for that part on different blueprints that we get. So we have to look at those in order to figure out how parts are made then. So even looking back, I then contact the engineering department and they will give me these little pictures and showing exactly where the parts get machined. So that also tells us exactly how the parts will get finished. So from going from the finishing, then we get to go to shipping. And the shipping sheet tells us exactly how everything needs to be packaged and there's pictures so the guy another job in quality is x-ray where you bring in samples to verify the internal soundness of the castings so i have a casting in the booth right now and i can show you what it looks like Great. Thank you so much. That was so cool seeing what a foundry looks like inside. Thanks to all of you. Next, um, we have John with Fincantieri Marinette Marine. He's a production supervisor. And if he could can, come online. Can you hear me? I can. Okay. Uh, first off, I apologize. Our uh, video is not working. So it'll be sound only. Um, like you, like you said, uh, my name is John Majdowski from uh, Fin Canty Area Marinette Marine. Uh, I'm a production manager, and uh, what I do, I oversee um, all the ships that are currently in the water. Uh, fin Canty Area Marinette Marine is a shipyard, and we are building the littoral combat ship for the uh, uh, United States Navy. Uh, my background, I actually started. Um, I actually have a deep passion for uh, ships in the marine industry. Uh, ever since I was a, a small kid, my, my father built a, sh uh, built a boat. So by, by default, I kind of got wrapped up into it. Um, I, w I originally went to college at uh, Northern Michigan University. And uh, I actually uh, have a two-year associate degree in a CAD mechanical. Um, I'm a, by trade, I'm a, a CAD designer. I've uh, experienced with AutoCAD, SolidWorks, and a number of other programs. After college, I, um, I worked at a uh, industrial ladder manufacturer, believe it or not, and, uh, and I handled all their, uh, all the uh, special and custom designs. And I worked there for five years, gained a ton of experience in manufacturing, um, especially in welding, et cetera. And uh, from there, I had the chance to uh, chase a dream. And I transferred to um, a shipyard in Bath, Maine, um, all the way out on the East Coast, which uh, where I started in engineering. Uh, from there, I transferred back to the Midwest, uh, came back home and got a job at Marinette Marine and um, started in engineering here and worked my way into manufacturing as a supervisor. And uh, a decade later, I am, I've been, uh, I'm now a production manager in charge of uh, um, multiple ships on the waterfront. Um, my, uh, my typical day uh, is a lot of production meetings, uh, making sure cost schedule performance is, uh, is met on all the vessels and also oversee test and trials of the ship. Um, 
we take the ships out on the Great Lakes, we run them, we test them, and we sell them to the uh, United States Navy. Um, the best part about my job, honestly, is the industry itself. Um, I personally was not a, a, I did not serve our country. I didn't, I was not in any of the armed forces, but this is my way of giving back. And um, I think that's a, a great opportunity that a lot of us have. Um, skills from high school that, that really keeps me going. Uh, honestly, it's people skills and, and being able to talk to people, being able to talk to all different types of people and different types of personalities. There's a, a, you know, millions of different people out there and just being able to communicate is, is key. Um, one of the major skill sets that uh, in the shipyard that uh, if you're interested is being a hard worker. It, it is hard work, uh, but all jobs require hard work. Uh, and it, with enough dedication and pride and, and hard work, and willingness to learn something new, be able to take direction, you can go anywhere. Um, the, uh, the industry is, is growing and we are looking for people um, that wanna learn skilled trades. through skilled trades right out of high school. Um, if you wanna be a welder, electrician, an outfitter, painter, uh, we, have, we have jobs, we have jobs available on the job training. I'm a big proponent of on-the-job training. You can't learn how to build a ship at college, and uh, it's really it's really part of it. Um, but yeah, the um, uh, like I said, Fincantieri is a, a it's a great place. We we're serving our country right here in uh, Northeast Wisconsin, and uh, from Northeast Wisconsin, our ships will go all the way around the world and defend our freedom. So it's a it's a special place. Thanks so much, John. That was great. I've been on the littoral combat ship and it's amazing that <laughs> that was built right here in Wisconsin. Yes, and it is. A big ship like that can go 50 miles an hour. That's crazy. Yes, it is. <laughs> Next, we're going to have Bill and Nancy with Haas uh, Factory Outlet uh, talking about machining careers. Bill and Nancy. Good morning. I think I'm going to talk. Nancy's got a uh, is talking later in your HR commitment. Um, my name is Bill Diamond. I work for Gossiger, which most people know as the Haas factory outlet in Wisconsin. We sell and service, <coughs> excuse me, CNC machine tools. So we're in a lot of the schools, et cetera. A lot of people know the name. Uh, my current role with the company is I'm uh, my title is educational manager, and I'm actually um, I don't know what's going on with the screen, Ann. You're good. We see you oh, now. I'm good. Okay, I'm sorry. So as I was saying, my current job title is educational manager. I'm working directly with the schools, which has been challenging during the COVID time, but I actually spent um, 28 years in the maintenance and service technician, as well as management with the company. What I'd like to talk about today is a uh, service technician, which is what I started out um, at the Haas factory outlet doing. So as a CNC service technician, you need to know how to make a part. So a person, you know, right now in the machining industry could could become a CNC service tech. You need to know how to make a part so you can troubleshoot and program that part or help the customer program it. Um, you need to understand the control as well as the CNC machine. There's a lot of technology involved with CNC nowadays, which includes uh, you know, lasers, ball bars, a lot of precision measuring equipment, as well as hand tools and mechanical aptitude. Uh, one of the most important skills that I found getting into this industry was math, like geometry and precision measurement. You need to understand it and need to know uh, 
you know, what tools to use and what the units of measurement equate to. Um, communication skills are super important. I know a couple other people have brought that up, but you need to be able to communicate with the customer, your coworkers, um, other people as you're out in the field uh, helping them. Um, you need to be PC literate, which I'm sure most people are, but at my age, some people are not. Um, you know, technology and computers are super important. Um, organizational skills, you would have a parts inventory. You need to be, you know, personally organized as well as um, organized as the company would want you to keep your, your tools, your equipment, and your parts and such organized. Um, technology nowadays, you know, a service tech doesn't necessarily have to report to a site and go and look at something. We, uh, we now have a system that we're using that's called Lightning PC. So your day may not necessarily start out being dispatched to a customer. You may be using a computer or a pad or your phone to to communicate and uh, discuss with the customer whatever whatever problem that they're having. Um, you know, a typical day got asked about that. I think across the board, what I've heard is there there isn't necessarily a typical day, which is what you know, which is a fun part of the job. You're not going to the same place or seeing the same things, same problems day after day. Um, we, we use a PC, you know, you log in in the morning to get your job. And like I said, that could be working with a customer through the lightning system. It could be uh, being dispatched to a facility. Um, the likes of my job and the company I've been with, I've been with Haas for 21 years. I've been with Gossiger 18. Um, we did get bought by Gossiger. You know, like I said, no day is the same. It, different problems, different machines. The company that I work for, Gossiger, also has tuition reimbursement. So I was able to advance my career through time and the company paid for all of that, which was awesome. I never had a student loan or anything like that. My post-secondary education that Gossiger assisted with was uh, maintenance training, OSHA classes and safety, always being safe, um, how to deliver stellar service. I did some seminars in that, effective communication. Um, so that was a great benefit for you know, working for Gossiger for all this time. Um, you know, as far as CNC technicians go, there's about a thousand CNC machines sold just in the state of Wisconsin annually. So the, the jobs are out there, they pay good, and the, you know, kind of the sky's the limit. That's all I got. Thanks. Thanks, Bill. Thanks so much. Uh, machining is always showing up in our surveys as being the hardest to fill. So a lot of career opportunities in machining. So thank you. Next, You're welcome. we have Lou with EMT International and Lou is a mechanical engineer. Lou. Thank you, Ann. <clears throat> Good morning. My name is Lou Goss. I work for EMT International in Hobart, Wisconsin. We specialize in high speed, high color printing machines. I graduated from Green Bay Southwest High School and I started my post-secondary education at UW Stout. And after a one year hiatus of college, I started back again at NWTC here in Green Bay. I went on to UW Green Bay after that and uh, was in there, <clears throat> excuse me, their engineering transfer program uh, time they didn't have a four-year mechanical engineering degree so 
I transferred to UW Milwaukee after that and um, completed my Bachelor of Science in Engineering there. Um, <clears throat> along the way, I worked uh, several jobs. I worked uh, construction in the summers. I worked at an auto service center, changing tires, and, uh, changing oil on cars. I even worked as a, a valet for a short time. Um, I interned at uh, Harley Davidson at their power transmission facility in Menominee Falls, Wisconsin. And then uh, after that, I graduated and, and took a full-time position at a company in Sturgeon Bay, Wisconsin, building industrial finishing machines. And then seven months ago, I took, took this job at BMT International. Uh, a typical day at my job consists of editing CAD models and drawings, as well as communicating with assembly and other engineering personnel, uh, communicating red lines, and other design changes that we may need, as well as communicating with customers and vendors, uh, effectively communicating our needs and their needs as well. The thing I like most about my job um, is the ability to improve designs. I've always enjoyed making something better. And I was asking myself, when I see something, whatever it is, how could this be done better? Um, and that's what really drives me. It's, it's kind of like R&D stuff all the time. Uh, the thing I like most about the company is the people. Um, and same can be said at the, the job I worked at previously for seven years was the people. Um, that's a big thing you'll find is enjoying the people around you. They make, they make the day uh, a lot smoother, make it more enjoyable. Um, as a side note, another thing I really enjoy about about EMT as a company is uh, my commute. Uh, my previous job, I round trip commuted 100 miles every day, and um, and now I commute about a one mile walk every day. Uh, so that's really nice. Uh, and, and some people don't mind commuting, and, and I didn't for a long time. But as life gets busier, and perhaps you end up having kids or, or just to take on a lot more responsibilities. It's, it's kind of nice to be close. Um, <clears throat> what post-secondary education do I need for my job? Uh, we need a Bachelor of Science in Engineering. Uh, it's preferred here. And on a very regular basis, I use a lot of my calculus and advanced math skills um, and how those uh, that calculus and integration applies to forces and acceleration, velocities, et cetera, especially in a dynamic uh, situation. And uh, the things that I use on the job that I learned in high school uh, is everything. And like a couple of our speakers mentioned, it is a very good basis and foundation uh, is your high school education, how to communicate, how to handle yourself as a professional, how to handle yourself as an adult. Um, and then beyond that, that sets you up for your, your post-secondary education, if you choose to, and, and how you handle yourself as a professional. And, um, and I actually, when I started here at EMT, I found out that they use uh, the, the CAD program that they mostly use here is Autodesk Inventor. And that was the first 3D CAD program that I learned on uh, over 15 years ago. And so it's kind of funny how things come full circle. I, I've used all sorts of different CAD programs, you know, Autodesk, AutoCAD 2D, uh, Pro Engineer, Creo, uh, SolidWorks. It, it's good to have a good um, broad look at, at all those design programs if you choose. So thank you and good luck. Great. Thanks so much, Lou. The last speaker we have is Dr. Terry from UW Green Bay. Uh, she is um, in the engineering area, which um, is a great transition from uh, Lou's conversation. So, Dr. Terry. Um, looks like she may have had to drop off the call. So, in the meantime, why don't I? Um, give the students that are participating the opportunity to ask any questions. 
you can ask the question in the chat box um, to any of our um, speakers today. So if you'd like to ask a question now, <clears throat> just type it in the chat box. And then um, the rest of the day, um, you have your student worksheet that from 11 to 11.30, um, we are asking you to go online to do some research on the companies that are here today. We have a scavenger hunt where you're going to be able to um, find the answers by looking at, at those websites. And then you're going to be joining us again at 11.30 for those of you that are participating today, October 23rd. Um, at 11.30 to noon will be HR speakers talking about how to find a job and how to be successful on that job. And then after that, uh, for those of you that are joining us uh, the following week and watching this on the pre-recording, um, your, your worksheet will give you all the information you need to um, watch the videos as well as um, the websites to find the answers to the scavenger hunt. And then by um, completing that and giving it back to your teacher, you're in a drawing for a $25 gift card. And I'll be announcing that in November and your teacher will let you know if you want. So last call for any questions. And if there are not, I just wanna thank everyone for participating today. Um, we're really excited about helping you explore career fields um, because manufacturing is such a wonderful career to go into. Thanks again for joining us and we'll see you back here at 1130 for those of you participating today live on, on October 23rd. Thanks again. Um, have a great day. Thank you. And you can go off the call now. Thank you.